Hi, everyone, and welcome to Data Quality Meetup. This is our first event in what's hopefully going to be a series of um, events. And first things first, I would like to thank everyone who came today, and especially our panelists and speakers who committed their effort and time to share and make this event awesome. Um, wanted to introduce myself quickly. My name is Gleb and I'm CEO and co-founder of Datafold. We automate regression testing for data pipelines. If you're curious about our product, uh, you can follow up with me offline. Before Datafold, I was data product manager, data engineer, data scientist at companies like Lyft and Autodesk. So why data quality and why Meetup? So in 2010, the major question on data teams agendas was how can we store and process all data that we need for analysis? How can we orchestrate the pipelines? How can we connect our CRM without data warehouse? Luckily, we have great mature tools and best practices and framework for these problems today. And uh, today we're faced with a different question of how can we find the data that we need and how can we trust the data that we have? And how can we ensure that uh, the data that we rely, rely on for making decisions either by humans or by machines in our machine learning models, how can we make sure that data is reliable? So that's the big question and that's why we're here today. And uh, just to highlight some of the interesting uh, research that I've been doing when talking to companies, it seems like a modern organization has 10 to 100x more tables, more data sets than employees. So this is just a really interesting number that illustrates that we're now dealing with a variety and volume of analytical data far beyond any human's capacity to process and comprehend. That's why we need new tools. That's why we need new approaches. So a few things about our program today. We are going to have three lightning talks. So those are short presentations by industry practitioners and uh, followed by a panel discussion with um, a group of people who are both industry hands-on leaders as well as influencers and authors in the data space. We're also going to have Q&A as part of the panel. And uh, just to make sure that you don't worry if you need to run uh, sooner, we're going to record the event. We're also going to send a summary of uh, all the talks and all the tools and frameworks referenced here. So since it's an online event, a few logistics uh, points here. So if you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A button in Zoom. You can do it anytime. And if you'd like to speak, ask a question, or make a point, please um, raise a hand and uh, I'll give you the mic, just like I would do it in, a, in an actual conference. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Josh Temple, who is analytics engineer at uh, Spotify. And Josh will walk us through what it's like to manage data quality and establish analytics at small, medium, and large companies and how the needs evolve. So this will uh, set us very well for the further discussion. And while Josh is setting up, I'd like you to answer our first poll. So just a few questions. And by the way, uh, we're going to publish all poll results. With, uh, we'll share it with everyone, so don't worry that you'll miss anything. Uh, Josh, you're on mute. Okay, should be good now. Everything looks good? Yes, go ahead. All right, great. Yeah, so thanks so much, Datafold, for having me. I'm excited to speak with you a little bit today about data quality and, and how you can think about data quality depending on if you're a small, medium, or a large organization. Um, so I'm going to go through um, these three different company sizes and hit some best practices some what to do's and what not to do. Before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I work at Spotify as an analytics engineer. Previously, I worked at a company called Milk Bar, which is a popular bakery in the, in the US. I normally live in Brooklyn, and um, I've worked on a few different open source projects that I wanted to put out here if you are a Looker user. And then you can see my social there at the bottom. 
So today, going to be discussing a few different sizes of analytics teams. Um, the key sizes, I think, are data teams of one, where you have one person, small to medium, which is probably somewhere in the realm of you know, five to 20 people on an analytics team, and then large data organizations, which get much, much bigger than that and can be distributed and subdivided. So for each of these stages, I'm going to talk about what challenges are unique and some things you should definitely be doing, some things you should definitely not be doing. So as your company is growing and your data is growing and your analytics team is growing, it gets harder to do a bunch of different things. Um, it's harder to communicate with the people on your team. The, the data that you're trying to query is gets larger and larger and it takes more time and more resources to extract information about. Yeah, it's harder to track data throughout data pipelines and um, different systems that might transform it or monitor it. And it's also hard to understand, like Gleb mentioned, as the number of data sets is increasing, um, sometimes as much as 100x times the number of employees to know what is this, the quality of each data set that you might be working with during your job. And then lastly, it also gets harder to communicate with people. You can't just walk over to someone's desk and say, hey, we had an issue. This isn't working the way we think it is. You have to think about um, doing things in a more formal way. So I love this quote from George Bernard Shaw, which basically, basically says that most of the problems with data quality uh, come down to communication where we assume one that we assume something has happened. It's actually not happened or it's happened differently than we expected. And there was no communication around that piece of information. So I'm going to start with a data team of one and uh, I'm sure some of you are in this boat. I've been in this boat in the past. So as a data team of one, um, you know, you're working in a vacuum. You might be new to engineering disciplines like data testing and Git. Uh, also, your work might be unproven. You might be trying to prove to a small company that that your um, effort is justified and that you need a data stack or you need certain tools. So the first thing I recommend is that you really lean on your stakeholders for expertise. You might not, since you are a small team, you may not have a lot of history in the organization. You need to be able to consult with people and ask them, hey, how does this work? How does that work? Also, uh, lean on them as as domain experts, but also hold them accountable because um, if dirty data is flowing in, you're going to be spending all of your time cleaning other people's data. So hold them accountable, help them understand the implications of what happens when they don't set up that object in Salesforce correctly, or they don't configure things the way that they need to um, in order for things to work smoothly. Also leverage the community. So I highly recommend some Slack channels. The DBT Slack channel and the locally optimistic Slack channel are both really great places where you can go and just talk to other people who are doing the same thing as you and bounce ideas off of them. Learn how to test your data. It's really important that you can do that, that you have um, automated checks that are basically filling in the place of code reviews that would normally exist in a larger team. It's really important that you're testing your data. And um, leverage open source tooling. I think it's very, it's easy for people on teams of one, they, they want to try the new technologies, they want to try different um, software and things that they see out in the community, but use the things that are open source, like dbt is great for SQL. Um, dbt allows you to, from the command line, run SQL against your warehouse, to run tests against it, to manage dependencies between different tables. Create Expectations is another library that's really great for testing assumptions in Python. But don't get distracted by the shiny stuff. Don't get too distracted by going after the next big thing because this, those things are usually expensive and they take away a lot of time that you might be able to spend uh, being lean and working on what your company really needs. And lastly, don't get overconfident. So if you're a data team of one, make sure that you're testing the work that you do because no one else is really checking up on it. So. If you're in a small to medium sized data team, uh, once your company has grown a little bit, you start to encounter different challenges. So at this point, you probably have multiple developers on your team. They might be distributed or they might be embedded in other teams in the org. It's harder to hold a mental model of data. And so at this point, you really need to start thinking about what are the riskiest assumptions that we're making in our data warehouse and how can we test them with SQL? You should set up continuous integration to enforce things like, are my tests passing? Are naming and styling conventions being followed? Like you could even set up continuous integration to look at things like, are people writing doc strings or documentation for the code? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about continuous integration in a second. But another thing you can do is some basic data monitoring. So you'd be amazed how many issues I've caught in the past just by looking at things like how many rows were added to this table 
and see that in a dashboard every single day. Um, you can catch a lot of ETL problems just by looking at like very simple things like counts of rows and, and other metadata about your warehouse. Also, this is the point where you should really start communicating with your users about various incidents that you encounter. So if something's broken, um, you need to actually send out an incident report about that. You need to be professional. Take that extra effort to show that you're aware of what's happened and you have a fix in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. At this point, I definitely recommend that you buy instead of build. There's a lot of really great software as a service tech out for data organizations um, to do things like metadata catalogs and managed ETL. And um, you should definitely purchase these technologies instead of building them. It'll allow you to focus on the business logic and the things that really matter. And finally, uh, have a process for sunsetting or deprecating data. You're probably getting to the point where you have some data lying around that you don't know what to do with. This is a good point to put a process together to inform the people who might be using it, to shut it down and prevent um, old, unmaintained and, and poor quality data from lingering in your warehouse. So if you haven't used continuous integration, it looks something like this on GitHub. You can use different applications that plug into your version control hosting. And whenever you run some kind of pull request or you wanna merge new code in, you run these tests automatically to make sure that you have a stamp of approval before you release anything to master. So that lastly brings us to large data organizations. Uh, and large data organizations have some really unique challenges as well. Um, mainly data starts to get too big to query. You can't query the entire history of a certain table. You can maybe need to start looking at things in a partitioned way. Also sometimes data sets become very numerous, they're duplicative, you don't know what their quality looks like. So there are a lot of ways you can get around this. One way is to use tools that are synthetic data generators. So rather than testing with production data, you can use things like Rata Tool for Scala or Faker for Python, which will spit out data that meets certain constraints and appears like it would have come from your warehouse, but doesn't actually. Also, I would encourage you at this stage to start thinking about how you can test probabilistically. So rather than um, testing definite assertions, look at things like the, you know, the mean of this column should be in this range and the standard deviation shouldn't exceed X. Or look at things like the maximum of this column should not be greater than Y or the minimum should not be greater than zero. Those kinds of things can help you bound the descriptive statistics of certain types of data and make sure that they're in line with what you expect. Also, this is where you really should start investing in metadata. Um, you, should, you should think about um, showing things like data sets that are considered um, high quality. So for instance, we will often um, at Spotify, we'll, we'll call things golden data sets that have a stamp of approval on them. So people know that all across the company, this is a, this is a high quality data set that you could use. Similarly, we have an automated process called um, Test Certified for Data, which you can read a blog post that we published about this, where we will automatically certify certain data endpoints um, with a, again, with a little badge that goes right on our metadata page that shows, hey, the people who designed this data have met certain requirements, this data has been tested, it's been documented, and you can know that there's a degree of quality there. So I think with a large data organization, a lot of what you're doing really comes down to um, communication and documentation, but there's something that you should not do, and that is keep it to yourself. So many of the interesting innovations have come out of um, large companies who have done really cool work and have decided to share it with the community. So once you figure this out, share it with the rest of us so we can benefit from this. So to sum up, no matter how big or small your data is, uh, make sure that you test your assumptions thoroughly, preferably in a continuous integration or an automated framework. Um, document your data so people know how to use it and communicate with your colleagues, both on your internal analytics team and your downstream shareholders, stakeholders. Thanks very much. Cool. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, that was insightful. And uh, I'd like to uh, publish and share the results of our first poll. So it looks like we have um, um, teams of different sizes. And by the way, Sam, feel free to start setting up your, oh, sorry, not Sam, Balash, my bad, um, to set up your presentation. So we have uh, teams of different sizes. Uh, looks like 45% uh, of people here at the meetup come from smaller companies, 34% from medium size and uh, some from really large companies. And it also seems like uh, everyone is largely unsatisfied with the 
data quality in their organization. But there are some folks who are very satisfied. So I would be really curious to hear from, from them today. <laughs> what, is your, what is your magic bullet? Cool. So uh, I'd like to welcome Balash Mate. He's a um, data engineer and uh, he will uh, speak about some of the interesting work he's done with DBT, which is a very popular framework for orchestrating SQL ETL, which uh, has an interesting feature. You can include documentation and tests as part of the framework. And so uh, take it away, Balash. Uh, you're on mute. Yep, now I'm not. Uh, can you see the uh, presentation? Uh, not yet. One sec. Share screen. Now? Yes. Super. So a little introduction. Uh, our company, Ingatlon.com, is the uh, market leader real estate listing site in Hungary. We have about 150 people. Our data team is in the small size, uh, six people and one data engineer, that is me. And we had a data warehouse migration last year where we had an old PostgreSQL uh, data warehouse with a lot of store procedures that were doing the transformations that was orchestrated by Airflow. And uh, last year we moved all our uh, data related things to BigQuery and the transformation, the T in the ETL, was done with DBT and the orchestration is done by uh, DBT Cloud. And we had some great results and uh, installed some uh, software engineering principles uh, uh, in it and also uh, our daily runs uh, from two and a half hours shrink to seven minutes. So we were really happy with it and I will show you uh, some things about, uh, about it. This is our data infrastructure. I will just uh, give you a glimpse of it. We have a snowplow like uh, tracking and collecting of uh, event data uh, coming from the client and server side. We have uh, data application tools, Stitch and the Luma for our production databases to take the data into BigQuery. We have some homegrown uh, Airflow decks that take data from Salesforce and some custom uh, Google Sheets uh, to BigQuery through cloud storage. We also use Firebase Analytics and Google Analytics exports uh, that go into BigQuery. From then on, when we have loaded all the data, we run DBT on it to uh, make it available for reports. And then we use Data Studio and Tableau uh, in different teams of the organization to uh, showcase the results of the transformation tables. Uh, this is all the good part. The problem is that, uh, as Josh said, said it before, documentation is really important, but creating and maintaining it is always has always been a pain in the neck. Uh, either it be a Python script, but also for proper documentation for all the tables and the columns that we have in our data warehouse. We have several source systems, 100 uh, plus uh, source tables, 100 plus models in DBT, and uh, the documentation uh, previously could have uh, only been found uh, in Excel, in Google Sheets, sometimes in Confluence, but sometimes they were out of date. And sometimes they only resided in um, some developer's mind. And if they left, then uh, it was gone. And with the, our migration efforts, we wanted to focus on finally uh, making up for this documentation debt and uh, trying to come up with some solutions so that if uh, we onboard a new data analyst or data scientist, then he or she will know, you know what we have in store and uh, can uh, uh, work out his or her way more easily uh, with proper documentation. There are many tools for metadata and for documentation purposes. Lift some of them will be uh, showcased later. WeWorks has Marquez. Google Cloud has a data catalog kind of problem. But we stuck with the DBMT, DBT's um, documentation site that comes out of the box if you manage to create some uh, sources, uh, some uh, YAML files for the sources and models. I will show it in the demo how it looks, where you can attach the descriptions for the tables and also uh, for uh, data tests for uniqueness, for not null, for 
other things, but that's a bit of a different topic. I will uh, focus on the documentation. And there's a really uh, handy site where you can uh, see where all these uh, YAML files uh, end up in. But once we started uh, filling out the, the documentation, we wanted to somehow measure how we are making progress because there were so many tables that were really poorly documented before uh, in Google Sheets that we wanted to know where we are right now and then see how we can progress. I think there was a question about this and you know, there's a saying, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And so we wanted to give, give it a number, like what's the state of our documentation? And first we have to define what's a proper documentation for a table. And we came up with a, an easy uh, definition that uh, you know, the table has to have a description and all of, it uh, all of its columns uh, have to have one. Uh, you can mingle uh, with it or play around with it and have a different definition. We uh, went with that. And after that, you, uh, you, when you have it for one table, you wanna see for all the uh, your sources or all your models uh, how it is, and then it's just the ratio of the properly documented tables to all the tables. So if six tables are properly documented by this definition out of uh, 10, then you have 60% or uh, 60 as the score. And you know, as the time progresses, you can see if you made any uh, improvements. And just as an eye candy, we, with a, a small Python utility that we wrote, uh, we put on these uh, numbers on the on the GitLab pages of our uh, projects so that you see uh, where we are in this uh, documentation effort. So uh, from 60, you have yellow, and from 90%, uh, percent, uh, you have green. And it kind of helps motivate the team to, you know, to get it to, to get to get it to green. And once we, uh, we achieve that, the, uh, to maintain it. And uh, I will show you what DBT looks like and uh, how we can play with this uh, little tool. Just close this. So this is how you can. Um, uh, document your sources. You say that in what, which schema and which database it resides. It's a public data set from BigQuery and uh, you have uh, the names of the tables and the description and all the columns. You can set up tests in this case too and also in your sources but now I was focusing uh, just on the documentation. In this one when you are uh, documenting the tables then you see I have some accepted value tests I have uh, not null uh, uh, test later, but also uh, it's fairly well documented. And uh, once I run uh, this documentation uh, utility, then I, uh, in debug mode, then it says that uh, this model, uh, uh, this column is missing its description. This uh, sources, uh, uh, this sources, this uh, tables, this, uh, column is missing also its description. So for the sources, uh, two out of, uh, one out of two is well documented and from the models it's two out of three. And then when you look at it, then we see that this capacity ratio is missing. So if I fix it, just trip to and uh, run a dbt compile so that it makes a new manifest.json uh, that encompasses this uh, modification. And I run the tool again. And I will see that uh, now uh, my model has a uh, hundred uh, of the score and uh, the source is still at uh, 50. And if I want to uh, upgrade the badge, I just run this and uh, it finishes. And once I'm back, then the model looks is at 100%. So uh, we are happy with it. And then now just, we just need to uh, fix those uh, source uh, uh, descriptions that are missing. And what uh, we can achieve is this site with DBT where you have your sources. And uh, as you see, this is where uh, all these descriptions from the YAML uh, end up in. And for this fit and to capacity ratio, I haven't uh, updated it or started again the documentation side. That's why it's missing, but everything else is uh, uh, well.
output here. So from the CMO, it's some tool to, to make it work and to see what's, what's missing. Uh, you can make sure that this site is up to date and, uh, and uh, it's properly documented. And also you can uh, use these uh, uh, Python scripts in your CI uh, pipeline. So if it doesn't meet uh, certain threshold, then you can just reject the, the pull request. Or, and at the end, when everything goes well, you just update the, the, the badges so that uh, you know, the team can see uh, where we are. Cool, thanks so, so much, Valash. Yeah. Um, we have to move on to our next uh, topic. And by the way, I just, uh, yeah, Sam, feel free to set up. And I just uh, finished the poll for the DBT. Uh, it looks like um, almost 30% of uh, our attendees today are actively using DBT, which is great. And uh, about 40% have never heard of it. So hopefully you'll learn something from, um, from Balash today. And by the way, just to make a segue into what Sam is going to talk about. So DBT is a tool that uh, is really easy to set up. And so you can start when you have very little data, a very small team. But once your data grows and once you start having data sets that are not coming from your just SQL transformations, but from other sources, then uh, you may consider a proper metadata platform such as Amundsen. And so Sam is going to share um, his experience deploying Amundsen at uh, Edmonds. All right, yeah, thanks, Club. So I'm gonna be talking about enabling data discovery with Amundsen. My name is Sam, uh, and I'm actually a data engineer at Edmonds. Uh, so for, the, for uh, those that don't know, Edmonds is a car shopping website. Our mission is to make car buying easy. Uh, oops, there's a poll, moving that away. Uh, our data engineering team size is around 10 people. Uh, core data users, only around 50. Uh, data size greater than 100 terabytes, and we have much more than 1,000 tables, last I checked. And the problem I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, no centralized documentation historically and no catalog to find tables that we're interested in. So how can we um, solve this problem? Well, last year we decided that it was finally time to actually look into a data discovery engine or a data cataloging tool. Uh, and we sold it to our business uh, because there could be cost savings, which is always a good thing. Uh, less duplication, let's not create something that already exists better deprecation, maybe we can more easily figure out which tables are no longer needed based off of update history, et cetera. Uh, we, there'll be faster development time for our data scientists, our engineers, our analysts, and then maybe even we will have new business insights just because people can find data sets that they didn't even know existed. And uh, so this was the lay of the land, at least from our perspective last year, we broke it up into three broad categories, uh, the first being closed source. Uh, you know, you need, need some money involved uh, to go in that direction, but there's a lot of good products out there. The second, uh, we coined old school open source. Um, just older technologies still look like they work great. I know that Apache Atlas is still being used today and actually even integrates with the Munson, which I'll be talking about, uh, but we weren't so interested in going that route. And then finally, new school open source, which is uh, very brand new projects, new approaches within the last uh, year or so. Obviously, the winner for us was Amundsen from Lyft. Uh, thanks to the Lyft team for that. Uh, why did we end up choosing it? Uh, well, uh, it, well, so we didn't think that the cost for closed source was going to be worth, worth it, at least for our organization. That might vary for others. And as I already mentioned, we didn't want to pursue Hadoop um, technologies at this point. Uh, we also really liked Amundsen, Amundsen's architecture and approach. Um, it leverages a graph database, which we thought was very smart for modeling relationships. Uh, it integrates with Airflow, which we already use. And it's also highly customizable, which I'll show you in the demo. And finally, uh, the fact that it's open source is really exciting for us because it gives us an opportunity to also contribute to the project. So let's get right into that demo. Exit out of this. Okay, so hopefully you guys can still see. Uh, this is the landing page for Munson at Edmonds. You can see our logo up here. It's part of the customization. I'll start off showing you the uh, most, you know, one of the most important features, which is the search. Uh, that's obviously a big reason why we need this. Uh, you can do a uh, free text search here. So let me just start typing in zip. You can see that it has inline search results um, plus a, uh, a number representing how many results were found. Uh, we're, this is searching through the table description, column descriptions, uh, and even other pieces of metadata. I know there's a 
there's quite a few actually that are included in that um, those search categories. Uh, it also has advanced search functionality. So you can click here. And let's say I was only interested in tables that are in the vehicle schema. So I can do that. And great, look, all the vehicle tables. It also supports wildcard. So maybe I don't know exactly what the schema is, but that'll also work too. Uh, moving down, uh, we have tags. Um, so these are actually user curated uh, fields uh, that are edited in the web UI itself. Just a different way to group tables together. Uh, for example, maybe it's a raw table, which has no processing done on it, or maybe it's silver, there's a little bit of processing done on it. I mean, this is obviously going to be very specific to your organization. And again, it's user curated. So uh, pretty much anything goes, at least for right now, um, for, our, for our side here. And clicking on one of these will give you all the tables for that particular tag. Uh, moving down, bookmarks. Um, so we actually do authentication via Okta, which is obviously very handy. A lot of organizations use that. Uh, and this is just, you know, there's other things that are user specific, but one of them is that you can highlight tables that you're interested in. Uh, and I'll show you another thing that relates to users in just a second. Uh, popular tables, this is just based off of frequent usage information. Uh, based on the, you know, the number of queries happening for a table. And this is a great way for maybe new users at your organization to figure out which tables they should be using. All right, so let's jump into a specific table. Unfortunately, I only can get permission to show you kind of a simple demo table, but I think it still you know, delivers most of what I want to show. Uh, so the first thing here, you can see that this is the name of the table. Um, this is a Hive table, and it lives actually in our Databricks environment, um, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, this is the table description here, which is editable. Uh, it supports markdown, which is why you can see the bold and the, the bullet points. Uh, we can request a description. So maybe it's not filled out, or you know, maybe some of the column descriptions here are not filled out, which they definitely are not. Um, this will automatically email the table owner or owners, and you can provide some more insight into why you want these descriptions, et cetera. Uh, this is the tags that I was referring to from the main page. These are also editable. You can delete them, et cetera. Um, right here is date ranges. Unfortunately, this table is too small to be partitioned, but if you have some massive uh, partition tables um, on S3 or wherever, this is a great way to uh, show what is the earliest partition available and what is the latest partition available. Uh, last updated, uh, this is very valuable for our users as it indicates um, when was the last time this table was written to. If it wasn't written to for you know a month or a week or several days, then there's probably something wrong with the table. So it's a at least a, a simple check to say, should I be using this table? Uh, these are the owners. Uh, these are the frequent users, which clicking on that will actually take you to that um, particular users page. Uh, I already kind of briefly talked about the columns and column descriptions. These are also obviously editable. You have the type here. And then finally, um, everything below um, this field is uh, auto-generated. Uh, it's called programmatic descriptions. And this is uh, at least for our company, this is where we customize Amundsen the most, at least at present. Uh, you can see here this, this integrates with our anomaly detection tool uh, and, and shows a health status based off of how many um, uh, tests are failing on a given day. So if it's green, that means, hey, analysts or whoever, you're, you, know, you should feel confident you can use this data as it is now. And if, it's, if any of the tests are failing, this will show up as red. Uh, this is another simple S3 integration, which you know, will show like cost, et cetera. But again, you can put wherever, whatever you want here. And then finally, also related to the uh, anomaly detection stuff, this is a chart showing context. In this case, it's pretty useless, but if it was a little bit more of an interesting data, data set, it would flag potential anomalies and it would also show the trend over time. Um, yeah, so those are the, the uh, big pieces that I wanted to show from the demo. Jumping back just to finish off the presentation. Uh, so we released uh, Amundsen into production beginning of 2020, uh, but mostly just geared towards power users. Uh, the reception has been very positive via surveys. Uh, it definitely has been something I think a long time coming for our organization, and that's what we've been told. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have detailed usage statistics for you, uh, just because we are not automatically collecting those yet. Uh, looking forward, uh, we want to push Amundsen to be the single source of truth for the whole company, not just those power users, the data scientists, etc., that are currently mostly using it now. Uh, we want to iterate on those data quality features that I briefly showed you, that chart, the badge, and then finally, also ingest Tableau dashboards. Um, and that's, that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, great. So 
I'd like to transition us to our panel discussion. Uh, today, we have an awesome lineup of panelists from industry and academia and uh, thought leaders and authors in the data space. So I'd like to start with uh, brief introductions uh, from everyone. So why don't you guys uh, talk a little bit about who you are and uh, where you work and what kind of work do you do? Mara, do you want to start? Yep, I thought I was like, I think I'm going first. Awesome. Um, thanks love for having me. My name is Mara. I run the data science team at Patreon. Um, if you don't know, Patreon is a platform for creators to get paid via recurring membership. We have a data science team of seven data scientists, one ML engineer, and one data engineer. Um, and our org is about 240 people or so, um, mostly working with payments data, but a lot of behavioral um, analytics data as well. And we're a AWS shop. Um, so we use Redshift. Uh, we are migrating to Airflow right now. Um, we also use Amplitude and Avo, which is a really cool tool for instrumentation that's pretty new. Um, and then Tableau, Mode, and Databricks um, on kind of the statistical analysis and dashboarding side. Cool. Tobias? Uh, sure. So I'm Tobias Macy. I run the Data Engineering Podcast, and I've actually had uh, episodes about DBT and Amundsen on the show before. So another way to get some more context on those tools. Uh, Mark, who was actually on the show before, so hi. Um, I run the Data Engineering team, or the well, I run the Data team and the Operations team for a department at MIT called Open Learning. So I'm responsible for a lot of the cloud automation stuff there, and I'm actively building out the data platform, which has sort of grown ad hoc. So there are a lot of different silos across different business units and trying to build out stuff to sort of coalesce all of that. Currently focusing on Dagster as the first implementation as our ETL platform and looking to use things like Pulsar for some of our streaming data and building a data lake, uh, making some use of Dremio for right now, taking a look at um, uh, Presto as an alternative to that down the road. So uh, yeah, if anybody's interested in learning more about any of that, everything I do at work is open source. So feel free to check us out at github.com slash MITODL. Thank you. Mark? Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Grover. I'm a product manager at Lyft in the data team. I, uh, um, I'm, I've also, I'm also one of the creators of the Amundsen project that was talked about. And in the past life, uh, I worked on what Sam called old school, old school <laughs> technologies in the Hadoop space. Uh, uh, at Lyft, uh, we use Amundsen, obviously, for data discovery. We have uh, some custom tools for doing ETL development. We don't use DBT or anything like that. Uh, and then for analytics, we use tools of the nature of uh, mode. Uh, and then we have some use of Apache Superset in there too. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, Svetan? Hi, everyone. I'm Svetan. I lead the product analytics team at Thumbtack, which is a team of about 20 or so people. Um, we actually consume um, data and our job is to turn it into insights and into better products. So that's why data quality is super important to us. Um, we have all of our data on BigQuery. Cool. And Michael. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Kaminsky, um, based out of Mexico City. Uh, I do a bunch of things right now. I'm an, and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur working on a number of different products, some of them more related to data than others. Um, I use a lot of different technologies. I've been using DBT for a very long time. I'm very familiar with BigQuery and Redshift. Right now, I'm actually spending most of my time working in R, um, both on like proprietary stuff as well as doing a fair amount of open source work trying to help um, build out the, the R and AWS integration ecosystem. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So I'd like to kick off with uh, one of the questions that was upvoted on our uh, question panel. And by the way, thanks to all attendees who voted for questions or submitted the questions. And I think the, the important one to start with is everyone is talking about data quality and about the tools and about the importance of it, but how do we actually think about setting the goals there and the KPIs and measuring it? So you can't really measure, well, you can't really improve what you can't measure. So 
how do you formulate the goals for your teams and how do you know that you're making progress? And uh, here I'm really curious to hear from our guests uh, from the industry. So Mora, Tsetan, Mark, um, who are leading data teams. Uh, really curious to hear what do you what do you think about KPIs? Yeah, I can I can kick us off here. Um, this question actually got me thinking because um, we don't have formal KPIs, um, and we probably will have KPIs soon. Um, the um, the way I think about this is that there is this one uh, moment in our consumption of data that is very obvious to everyone where things have gone wrong, and that's when you have some kind of a data incident. Uh, and you have to restate the data, you have to go back and tell people, hey, what I told you yesterday is actually not completely true. You have to kind of change your understanding a little bit. That is not okay in our world. Um, and that to me is a very good sign that something upstream or up uh, in our pipeline is not working well. Um, and so we kind of keep, keep an eye on these things. Um, you know, you could apply kind of the same post-mortem culture that we have for the rest of our engineering uh, efforts. You could kind of log these incidents and count them on a weekly and monthly basis. Unfortunately, uh, I'm actually curious to hear from the other panelists, but you know, we have these things probably at least once a week uh, and they're of various severity. Um, so you obviously don't want to take everything, everything uh, with, uh, you know, um, the same level of seriousness. Uh, you know, if, if, a, if a certified table uh, doesn't refresh, that's kind of a big deal. If a tracking event from, an old version of the iOS app stops firing, that's probably a lot less severe. So you kind of want to weigh these things a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, I'd say first thing is incidents. The second thing is um, so one of the presenters talked about uh, certification. I think kind of this notion of coming up with a ratio that tells you how much of the data that's consumed comes from certi certified sources is sounds very appealing. We have something similar to that. Um, but it's not um, kind of as specific as a ratio. We kind of keep track of, you know, all data versus certified data that has SLAs and, you know, people maintain and, and um, uh, build these tables every day on the analytics or on the data engineering team. So I'll, I'll just leave it at those two things for now. Yeah, we, we similarly at Patreon use this idea of coverage. Um, and I, I think one of the important things we try to do is we try to rank the priority of relevant data sets. So we have like a set of core tables and we try to understand what, per, what coverage do we have there for documentation and for quality checks. Um, and I think your coverage kind of standards and KPIs can differ based on how important that data is to your organization, to your metrics. Um, the other thing we started just to do very recently, which I'm super excited about, is we're using Avo for behavioral analytics. So all the instrumentation in the app we send through Avo, which is a pretty new tool for instrumentation. And they have some automated quality metrics as well that tell you how many issues you have in your um, analytics tracking. So for example, like maybe an event property is camel case instead of um, instead of snake case or maybe like something the name changed from day to day and they actually will aggregate those issues and you can see them over time um, so we've started to use that as well and we'll have kpis there around reducing the number of um, issues that we have in our auto app um, which is at least a good start for us on the um, kind of behavioral analytics uh, instrumentation side great I, I actually i have something to add to that or maybe like pose a, a further question um, back when I was running running the analytics team at Harry's, which is an e-commerce company, um, I struggled with this idea of KPIs a lot. And one of the things that I struggled with is that for me, it was really easy to come up with KPIs that were sort of, you know, programmatic in things you can measure, right? Like documentation coverage, right? And I thought that made a lot of sense. But my problem was that I also see the role of the data team as also being like an R&D team, right? And so my worry was that our KPIs would focus us on doing a lot of infrastructure and a lot of maintenance, but not doing a lot of like research and like research and development, which is where I think that actually most of the value of a data team comes from. And so my problem with KPIs was like, if we focus on the KPIs, we're going to ignore this other stuff that's really important, but that's harder to measure. And so it's like, it's like the, you know, the, the, the man searching for his keys under the spotlight, right, rather than focusing on the things that are most important. I'm curious how the rest of the panelists think about that problem. Hey, Michael, I have a question for you. So in your definition of the data team, uh, what is the scope? Does it include the platform as well as the analysts and the scientists or just the platform? That's a great question. Um, for me, at least my experience is mostly working with startups. We're working with, you know, very small teams, right? So teams of like 
one to five or one to 10 people. And generally that team covers all of those things. So it's data science, analytics and BI, analytics, engineering and platform. Um, and it so also maybe sounded, that's maybe that's why this question doesn't make sense to everyone. Right, right, right. And it also sounded to me you buy the notion of KPIs for the perhaps the platform or the infrastructure pieces, but it's more of the analysis and the science pieces which are like on your mind, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Hey, I'm not going to answer that one. I'll let other people answer that one. I was just clarifying. I was going to say, this is one of my favorite questions of like, why are data teams so hard to measure if data teams are doing all the measurement? Um, I've definitely talked to data leaders that have, um, have a KPI is like the number of insights published per week or month. I personally think that creates the wrong incentives for analysis and research. Um, like it's going to make my team want to just like come up with some easy facts and publish those out and say that that's an insight. I think for me, um, it comes down to like how important, how much of an issue is your data quality that you need to focus on that as a priority versus the other things your team is trying to drive, whether that's R and D or insights or um, impact for the business. And for us, um, I think a lot about this like toil factor is how much are your data scientists toiling, looking for the data, trying to figure out what this column means. That factor can only be so high until you start to have data scientists and analysts that are angry and upset and like hate their life because that's what they're doing all day. So as a, as a data team, you have to think about like how much do we need to reduce the toil factor versus all the other things that we're trying to drive as an organization. Um, and that I think is best, best measured by asking people like how much are you toiling and how much, how dirty is the data just like heuristically um, rather than an actual number. Makes sense. I'm curious to hear also what, what Mark thinks about the KPIs because I know that uh, that that's been a big, big uh, focus for your team, Mark. Yeah. So um, perhaps switching back to the data quality KPIs, and I think there are metrics here um, that we had considered. Uh, I think um, some of this is specific to your organization as well, but at, in the organizations I have seen data quality issues don't always show up as incidents. That means that we couldn't use incidents or um, as, a, as a metric to bring down necessarily. Plus incidents are also like a variety of different other reasons that can cause them. So we had to uh, come back to using a metric that I, I think was more intrinsic and it's lined with what uh, uh, Maura was talking earlier, which was coverage. So for us, that is number of tests and the platform team produces a, a primitive, that of a test that uh, folks can employ. And then we measure that coverage or the number of tests. Now, in my opinion, metrics, there are two really important metrics when it comes to any product. It's adoption and it's satisfaction. So like number of tests will give us some proxy for adoption. And then satisfaction is usually around the experience of creating a test or the experience of debugging a test. And for that, we, we run a qualitative survey to, uh, to talk to the owners who are actually setting those tests up. Great, thank you. So actually the most upvoted question that we got for today was, uh, can we leverage ML to do the data quality analysis? Do we actually have to, to put all the tests and uh, you know, uh, be satisfied or not satisfied with the experience of writing those tests, or can we actually leverage some automation and help uh, you know the machine tell us uh, whether the data is is right or wrong? So I'm curious if anyone had uh, thoughts on this and what works and what doesn't when it comes to automation. So I don't have any direct experience with this, but one thing I will say is to caution against the garbage in garbage out principle, where if you're using bad data to train a machine learning model to recognize bad data, then <laughs> you're potentially going to be shooting yourself in both foot, both feet. So uh, I think that there is some potential for value there. If you have a sort of general sense of what your data quality is and a good baseline to start from, and then do anomaly detection to say, okay, this is something that is an outlier from the rest of the data that I'm working with. But if you don't already have that baseline set, then I think it could probably be fairly difficult to be able to build a useful model to highlight uh, useful anomalies or uh, errors in the data that you're working with to be able to drive up quality. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. The way I interpreted that question was that there are two options. One option is that there is an ML algorithm who's like actually putting some tests on your data. And then the other option is that there's humans who are actually curating and putting tests on the data. 
And I actually disagree that it's a versus premise. I actually think it's an and premise. We have to do both. And we actually, I think, in my opinion, the key uh, here is to uh, figure out a good constructive way to get the human in the loop of the algorithm. Uh, and the key reason I think that is because, A, I think not all data is con created equally, right? Often we see in organizations that 20% of the data sets lead to 80% of the queries. Even within a data set, you will find certain columns are actually much more useful uh, than others, right? So the first pass, I think it always makes sense to have a human put uh, uh, tests on those columns that we know are, are impactful to the organization. And then as we work on algorithms to put tests, I don't think it makes sense to do like a boil the ocean kind of approach, but instead it's very important to use the usage metrics to actually power which tests are gonna be put on what columns. And it's always important to actually get the approval process from the owner because I know I would raise my hand, I would love to hear who else has been here like getting pinged by a robot who put some tests somewhere and it's just like thinks the it's anomalous, right? And it's actually not, it's uh, appropriate for the data set in question. Yeah, and that brings in the other useful element of data quality is just having the domain expertise of understanding within the data set itself, what are the expectations of what normal looks like and what is the overall context in which this data is being produced and consumed in order to ensure that you're putting useful tests and useful checks on the data as it's being propagated through those different systems. Yeah. Um, another another interesting question that I think bugs many of uh, people who are here today and actually was upvoted is so we've been growing we, we we've been focusing on creation of data and creation of analysis and uh, growing our team and so we ended up with hundreds of tables thousands of reports in mode looker whatever the BI tool and you know zero tests and zero processes and how do we start you know what is the what can we do right now, given that uh, you know ML is probably hard to hard to implement right off the bat, and manual checks may be you know a long way to to go. So Well, the biggest thing is to just start somewhere. Uh, the useful heuristic there is what is the thing that is causing me the most pain right now because that's likely something that's going to be causing other people pain. And as soon as you address that, then it gives you the space to be able to confidently move on to the next thing. And so you can get this ratcheting effect of right now everything is painful, but if, as soon as you start taking one step in the right direction, then every other step is going to be successively less painful until you get to a point where you actually do have some measure of quality in your data sets and some confidence in how things are being tested and vetted. Whereas if you just continue to let yourself sort of feel the pain and feel defeated, then you're never going to make that progress. Yeah, I'll tack onto that. And I'd say that like for me, there's sort of two things to do. One is triage, right? Which I think is what Tobias was basically saying. Like as things are coming in and people are complaining about it, like figure out, get, come up with some level of importance and then just use that to sort things. And the second is cleanup, which is like in the situation that you're talking about where there's like thousands of reports and thousands of tables, I think someone already said, you know, most of those are probably generating no value. Anytime that I've encountered that situation, like most of them, no one's looking at, you go talk to the owner and they're like, oh, I don't look at that anymore, I know it's broken. And so like going through that process of cleanup and just like getting rid of stuff that is infrequently used or not used at all, will make the problem seem a lot more manageable. I don't think there's that many organizations that have this huge sprawling thing and then like no idea where to start. It's probably that there's like 10 things that people look at and like that's the important stuff anyway. Yeah, on, on that point of, of cleanup, I, I think it's immensely important. And it's also one of those things that people don't usually consider sexy and appealing to do. Um, my kind of preferred approach is to kind of embed this into the culture of the team and pr uh, create the right rewards and recognition for people who do the, um, the grunt work. Um, one kind of extreme example is, you know, at the next, for, for those of you who are leading teams, at the next performance cycle, incorporate uh, something like, has this person helped us um, clean our data in, you know, in their promotion announcement? I'm not saying that it should be promoted because just that, but in their promotion announcement, 
put a spotlight on their work around cleaning data, around making everything easier for everyone, and that's going to create a flywheel internally and kind of help that create that culture. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's really hard to, to get you know people to believe that this is uh, important work for for everyone and the whole team. The other thing I'd recommend in that vein is um, sometimes you just need to swarm on it. Like sometimes you need two full days and, you know, if you were in an office, order pizza and beer and soda and like get everyone just heads down doing it. Um, I think that if you try to do it like 20 minutes, you know, between analyses over a year, um, it sometimes is not as effective. That's definitely something we've done is like have these swarms. Um, and then the other thing I, I'd say to this question is like, make sure that the new data you're creating has some sort of curation or documentation built into the process so that you don't do this big cleanup and then you realize you've created all these new data sets that still have the same problem. Um, like make sure the looking forward that you're kind of solving the problem as well. Yeah, and tacking on to the end of that, one of the things that's bitten me a number of times is walking into a situation where there was the implicit uh, understanding that the data retention policy was infinity. And so to the point of making sure that you have some policy in place as you start making those improvements that anytime new data sets get created, you have something to say, this is what the life cycle of that data looks like. And this is what the retention policy is where you don't necessarily have to s apply it in a blanket way, but have something so that when somebody creates a data set, they understand that there is going to be some period where you're going to come asking and saying, do I need this? You know, do we need this anymore? Can I delete it now? Because it's causing pain and confusion for other people who are accessing it when it's no longer valid. Yeah, uh, we have time for one more question. And I'd like to double click on the point of, uh, you know, ownership of data. So how do you solve it? for it, for the ownership in terms of the culture and the processes and uh, incentives, uh, like what Svetan uh, has brought up. So do, does every asset in your organization, data asset, dashboard, report, table has an owner? Does it have to have an owner? In our case, we do. We have multiple owners, so that if one of them is on vacation, another one can pick up things if, if there's an incident. Uh, and owners get emails when table changes when the table changes when there's some failure in the loading process. So yeah, I I, I think you, you need to you need to have owners. I I would agree with that um, in principle, but I think in practice I have found that hard to work. Um, for for me, it's been identifying the top twenty percent of the the data assets that uh, provide 80% of the value and just going, hitting those 20%. And I, I mostly end up ignoring the rest 80%. That's a great point, actually. We do have owners for the most used tables, not for everything. Good point. Yeah, at Patreon, we're not quite at a place yet where everyone has owners. I wish we were. I think the most frequently asked question is probably who owns this? <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things I've been trying to do is, is I think at the end of the day, ownership is like a people problem or a people challenge. And so finding the people that are like obsessed with data quality, obsessed with cleanup, obsessed with owning and putting them in the right roles and putting them in the right space. Um, and then I also think from a, like a culture perspective, there's a lot you can do at Patreon. We have the data science seal of approval, which is like a literal emoji and a phrase that people use when something um, is data approved. Um, and so the, if there are ways you can make data cleanup and ownership fun or gamified um, or give people points or badges, uh, that can actually surprisingly work pretty well in, in going a long way for improving data quality. Great. And well, just to tack onto that, one other thing that I, an interesting conversation that I had is the idea of the treating data as a product that gets produced by and for different teams within an organization. So rather than just having everything be the responsibility of the data team, have it be the responsibility of whoever is actually creating that information to treat it as a product and ensure that it is being produced in a clean fashion. And so that you have a way of tying it back to whoever is actually producing that data and uh, making them be the sort of ultimate owner of it. But just having that idea of the uh, data mesh is the terminology that was used in the conversation I had. But every, you know, treat, treating data as a product that is consumed by different teams and sort of, uh, creating the ownership in that regard rather than having everything be the responsibility of a smaller group of people. Cool. Well, uh, it's been an awesome panel. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And thanks so much for the speakers who put the time to share their great best practices and accomplishments with uh, the community.
This is just a slide to shout out the uh, tools that were mentioned today. We'll also send some information on them and also uh, how to contact the teams if you are interested. And uh, please stay tuned for the future events. We'll definitely hold more of those and uh, answer more questions and go in depth on some of the topics that everyone highlighted as, uh, as interesting. Thanks everyone and uh, till next time.